What is up guys, it is Sunday the 23rd of August and this, this is the first video I've made in like two weeks, but it's also the tech news roundup. Since it is the first video in two weeks, there are quite a few things I want to cover. A lot of it is from this past week, there's one that isn't necessarily from the last week, which I'll talk about at the very end. However, let's dive right into the news. First up, are you fed up of travelling across the ground in, like, cars and stuff? Well, so are Lilium, and they've been testing these really cool, like, just, just, let me, let me show you. This right here is what their vehicles look like. It's a VTOL, it's a vertical takeoff or landing vehicle that is designed to be an autonomous taxi that flies and you like use for an app that looks like quite similar to Uber's app actually again image right here and it looks really cool. The idea is quite similar to a cab or an Uber where you order it on your phone and then it like you know you, you go to wherever it is and then you take it somewhere but unlike a cab this is you know air-based. Though they are testing them in Germany, these aren't the final versions. The final versions are expected to have roughly 36 engines to be completely electronic and to house five passengers. On top of that, as previously mentioned, they'll be completely autonomous and will cruise at roughly 300 kilometers an hour, meaning, you know, if you're in a rush, that's not an issue. Part of it being a VTOL means that it can hover mid-air, and which, you know, looks really cool, but it can transition from hovering to then moving. So, you know, if you're like sightseeing, for example, you can stop in mid-air, take a look around. Imagine the Casey Neistat video that would come out of that, right? He would be, <laughs> Casey would love that. The prototype is only a two-seater instead of five, but you know, they're, they're testing it here. And I mean, if one of us came to the UK, how would you not fly everywhere? Just, why, why not? Elsewhere, Snapchat unveiled something this week on Tuesday, and the reason that's interesting is because that was the day that the Facebook F8, like, developer conference started, and you know the whole thing with Facebook and Snapchat and copying each other? Well, I say copying each other, but it's primarily Facebook copying Snapchat. And the latest thing for Facebook to copy off of Snapchat is these thing called world lenses. Now, normal lenses that, you know, generally tend to apply on someone's face, people haven't really realised or considered that it's AR, mainly. It's very low-level AR, but it is augmented reality. With world lenses, however, Snapchat have taken this to a completely new level. These things, you just, like, press a button and it's like in the world and you like walk around. It's something that's very hard to explain without showing you so here's a quick snippet from the advert. And if you're not sure for the thing that's in the description below and it looks really cool like the idea of being able to pin something in physical space but on your phone screen and then walk around is something that's really awesome. I've been using Snapchat more and more. Let me grab my Gorillapod, hang on. Using this Gorillapod right here combined with like the vertical phone mount and a remote trigger means that I've been doing sort of more and more high production quality content on Snapchat. So to check me out, scan the code right here. Trust me, you won't regret it. Lots of cool stuff happening there, and lots of cool stuff coming soon. The world lenses are genuinely something different though, and that's really cool. And the real question is, how long will it take for Facebook to copy it? Is it gonna be months? Is it gonna be weeks? Is it gonna be days? Probably months. And once Facebook have done that, we'll wait for the next Snapchat feature for Facebook to copy, because they're not gonna come up with their own now, are they? That's just ridiculous. And in the last of the really big news I want to talk about, MasterCard unveiled their new credit cards that have built-in fingerprint sensors. This follows their earlier announcement of a little e-ink display on the back of their cards to display the security number so that it could be changed very frequently so that if someone stole your card they couldn't just keep your security number and you'd have no hope. And I have to say the fingerprint sensor looks like a cool idea and means that you don't need to type your pin in but I'm not, you know, I'm not really sure how to feel about this because I'm not sure if it's going to come across gimmicky or if it's actually going to help. Although it works similarly to Android Pay or Apple Pay where you put your finger on the fingerprint sensor when you go to make the payment and it authenticates it for you, there are a couple of minor differences. First of all, the credit card itself doesn't actually have a battery built in, it gets power 
by when you like plug it in, it uses that for the pow to power the fingerprint sensor, which is actually really cool. But there is another issue, which is that, you know, if you are using your phone, then you can reset the fingerprint sensor, or you can use a pin instead. Whereas, although I'm sure you can use a pin instead on the credit card, you only have 10 fingerprints, and they're not that hard to steal anyway. All you need is something that someone has touched, like, recently, and boom, you have their fingerprint like that. It's not that hard, so we'll have to see. I think the interesting thing about this, though, is that it will mean that it will be definitely harder for criminals, because although you might be able to convince me to tell you my pin, which is one, two, three, four, you can't convince me to give you my thumb. I'm not just gonna cut it off and give it to you. I quite like this thumb, it's a good thumb. It means I can give people thumbs up. And with the lack of security around pin numbers, because people are idiots sometimes, frankly, and there are, they're, they're the most vulnerable part of a chip and pin card, we might see an increase in security as opposed to a decrease, which would be really cool. Elsewhere, I quickly want to mention this because it's just so ridiculous. The other day, an Italian court ruled that a man's benign brain tumour was related to the fact that he had to use his work phone most days of a week for large parts of a day. The man claimed that three to four hours of usage of his phone per day for the last 15 years led to a benign tumour, and the Italian courts agreed. In fact, they awarded Robert Romero 500 euros per month in compensation. The thing that makes this so dangerous is that that link isn't definite. We, no one has been able to prove that there is a link between brain tumours or brain cancer or whatever and mobile phone usage. And this Italian court has gone, well, you know, maybe there is. And the big part of this is that this is an illegal courtroom. This, you know, they're supposed to be definitive places where something either is or isn't. There is no middle space there. So although in real life there's a potential link that we can't prove, as far as courts are concerned now in Italy, there's precedence for people to claim outright that their cancer was caused by phone usage. Also, another quick note, Free has been having network issues this week that were really bizarre in the sense that if you sent a text message to someone, they went to the wrong person. If they just didn't get sent, I'd be like, yeah, sure, why not? That's a relatively fair enough issue to have. However, going to the wrong person is one hell of a mistake. There were rumours on Twitter that Free had potentially been hacked and that was part of the reason, but that seems untrue, which is linked to multiple which is linked to multiple things, including customers and non-customers receiving text messages from unknown numbers, which is the redirecting issue by the sounds of it. A spokesperson for Free said they're currently investigating the cause of the issue, so we'll have to wait and see what happened there. But you know, all is well now, so that's good. At least it got fixed. Finally, I really, really, really quickly want to mention that the update for Android Wear 2.0 came out on the LG G Watch R. Some people on the subreddit have been complaining. I just want to mention that I did have minor battery issues for the first couple of days. That seems fine now. Um, we'll, we'll see how it pans out. It seems all right. I haven't been having as many issues as everyone else on the forums, however. So if you've had the update and you like it, great. Let me know in the comments. If you had the update and you didn't like it, not as great. Also let me know in the comments. I've had this watch for nearly two years and the fact that it was a major update is really cool. I mean, I've never owned a watch for like two years before. I've usually lost them after like a couple of months. So that's cool. I might be upgrading to like a different watch. I don't know what yet. Maybe the Huawei Watch 2. Something different just to spice it up a bit. But we'll have to see. Anyway, that is it for this video. If you liked the video, make sure to click like. If you didn't, I'm not quite sure what you're doing here. However, there is good news. You can click here to see the previous video, which was a tech news roundup from a couple of weeks ago. You can click here to see the video that YouTube thinks you'll like most, which could be anything because YouTube thinks you'll love it. And you can click here to subscribe. So make sure you do that because we have loads of really cool videos coming soon. Subscribe to see more videos like this one. And I'll see you guys next time.